Last year was terrible. It was a disaster. Some guys lost their boats and couldn't make their payments, and and uh, be, mostly because of the Klamath River uh, situation, uh, poor returns in the Klamath River because of the drought and water diversion. Mark Newell is a commercial fisherman and wholesale buyer. With an expanded season in 2007, Newell and other salmon fishermen were hoping that they would catch more fish. But they're reporting the salmon are even harder to find this year. The salmon industry over the last 30 years has been under a significant challenge. If you look at the harvest levels from 30 years ago, they were harvesting, uh, you know, 30, probably uh, close to 30 million pounds. Today they're harvesting about 7 to 8 million pounds. So that's a dramatic decrease. Gil Sylvia is the superintendent of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station in Newport, Oregon, and a marine resource economist. He and other scientists are looking for ways to protect salmon while increasing the amount of fish caught. They just place a piece of fin on the paper, and then they also put the scales in there as well. And then we take Those tissue samples taken by fishermen from fish they caught right are allowing scientists to use DNA in hopes of increasing wild salmon populations. The project, known as CRUISE, or Collaborative Research on Oregon Ocean Salmon, is an experiment that is in its second year. In the past, we always relied on something called a coated wire tag that we put into the heads of hatchery fish as we release them. So, Michael Banks runs uh, the genetics lab for Project Cruz. Many of the stocks are actually wild spawning and, and couldn't be tagged in that way. But these genetic tags are present in all, all fish because all fish have DNA. And so we, we now have an ability to, to pick up any fish from anywhere and, and make estimations about where it came from. Information such as where, when, and how deep each fish was when caught is recorded and put into a database. Last year, 72 fishermen took part in the project, and over 4,300 salmon were cataloged. The fishermen could use these data as a tool for them to be able to fish better, and they can also see where their fish originated from. Scientists hope this information will help them to protect salmon that came from a river with a stressed population from being fished. Instead, fishermen could pursue salmon from rivers with populations that are not in peril. Another aspect of the cruise program is aimed at adding value to harvested fish by sharing information regarding the catch. For example, there may be a unique run of, let's say, a run of fish from the Rogue River and we can identify 50 salmon that are being sold in the marketplace that are from the Rogue River that may carry a certain value to certain buyers. Uh, maybe, for example, they're trying to match it with a wine that's produced in the Rogue River. But what we think it's a value isn't necessarily with knowing the exact identification of every fish. We think with, where the greater value is to know that they're, they're managing and doing the science in the way that's going to be sustainable. The science of how to protect salmon as a sustainable resource, however, doesn't begin in the ocean. Many believe that the key to improving salmon population lies in the rivers where they spawn. Really the only one common thing that hatchery fish and wild fish have is water. Charlie Corarino is the Conservation and Recovery Program Manager for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Today, more than 70% of Oregon salmon begin their life in a hatchery. But there is evidence that hatchery fish have had a negative impact on salmon in the wild. But at the same time, we also realize the importance and the value of hatcheries. And that kind of brings us full circle about why we have the Hatchery Research Center here in Oregon. And that is to try to understand differences that may exist between the hatchery fish and the wild fish. The heart of the research center is four identical man-made streams. Scientists can control various characteristics of each stream to study what impact different changes might have on the salmon in each stream. It allows scientists to study not only how environmental changes affect salmon, but also why some salmon do better in adverse situations. David Noakes is the director of the research center. We're doing things, looking at the development of the brain structure, for example, and comparing that to the, the parentage and saying, you know, are certain 
parents more likely to produce young, that it will feed on certain kinds of organisms that will do better in certain kinds of habitats. It's the kind of thing that you wouldn't have thought about a few years ago, but we can do that now. There are nearly as many solutions as there are pieces to the puzzle of why salmon populations are dwindling. According to Nancy Fitzpatrick of the Oregon Salmon Commission, the puzzle must be solved if Oregon's salmon industry is to survive. Fishermen are just like farmers. We're harvesting not land product, we're harvesting ocean product, and we want to sustain the product as best as we can. We don't want to fish to the last fish. We want to make sure that there's more for the rest of us to continue fishing and for other generations to continue fishing. For Market to Market, I'm Jeannie Campbell.